jump in uh, to mm -hmm. some questions yeah, if absolutely. that's okay with you. Sure, sure. Um, one that came in yesterday from two new parents that I'm really getting to know, and um, so I want to thank them um, for writing in. Hi, Shannon. I would like to ask Dr. Doreen about strategies for having blood drawn. Our Fremont son is five years old with moderate autism and limited verbal communication skills. Our previous attempts at getting his blood drawn have ended with dad holding him down. He's Ugh. developing an aversion to doctors and we worry about even getting through the door this time. Any suggestions would be helpful. And again, they receive services at the Fremont office and um, I've had the opportunity to talk with, with these parents and I love them. Oh, They're just awesome. amazing, amazing parents. That's fabulous. I would love to um, find out who their supervisor is so I can directly talk to the supervisor and give them some feedback. But generally, I actually have a really good, uh, very detailed presentation I've done in the past on the subject of shots and doctor's okay. offices in general. Um, you need a little bit of time, like maybe a month, okay. and to do this, but it's not that hard. It's pretty easy, and it's essentially it's a sort of desensitization procedure. It's systematic desensitization, and what you're doing is it's a feared thing, right? It's, so any child, it's a feared process. So definitely, you want to be doing it over a shaping process. So it's not something you do suddenly. You can. That's called flooding. What you've done already. Flooding can be very traumatic. Flooding is basically putting the individual in the situation and just letting them deal with it, right. you know? And that's a pretty traumatic process. Um, sometimes it's done when it's necessary to be done and it is what it is, and then all you can do is just try to reinforce the individual for coping. And sometimes when it's a blood drawn, you don't know it's you coming. You just don't know what to you do. Don't have, you don't have time to But it, But it. once you go through this systematic desensitization procedure, it's done and you have it for life. Like that's it right. is something that where the child will no longer fear, that they'll be prepared for things like injections and blood draws much better. Yeah. So what you do is you will want to um, itemize every single step of a blood draw. Uh, and when I say every single step, we're talking about, you know, driving. Uh, it probably starts with driving to the doctor's office, right? That's, and I don't know if your child knows, um, maybe they recognize the building. It's from the point where any kind of anxiety would begin. Okay. Okay, so driving to the doctor's office is one. Next one is, let's say, getting out of the car and going in. Next one would be like getting in the elevator and going upstairs. Next one would be actually waiting in the waiting room. Next one would be going in and sitting or seeing the doctor. Next one might be sitting in the chair. Next one might be um, putting the um, elastic around, let's right. say, the, um, the, tourniquet. the tourniquet around the, your arm, uh, or even just put, opening your arm like that, putting your sleeve up, something, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, putting the tourniquet on, and then uh, actually the next one would be, you know, I'm making it, I'm listing them as more and more traumatic. Yes. Right? So then the next one would be, let's say, the uh, person coming, maybe manipulating the needles or right. the, um, the all the things that he's doing next the f next one would be maybe putting some an alcohol rubbing right. alcohol there and then finally would be the actual puncture yeah and uh, then sitting there for a duration of time so they can put the bottle so you split it up you know and then what you do is you start with the least traumatic which would be driving to the doctor's office right, right. as you approach the behavior the thing it gets more and more traumatic right. So you put all of these in a, on a list with the least traumatic at the beginning and the most traumatic at the end, and it could be 20 steps, it doesn't really matter. And each of those now, you will want to expose the child to each of those um, and pair the exposure with relaxation and high level of reinforcement. So now you can do this in two ways, and I suggest you do, do it um, visually first and then in vivo. So. What you would do is you would take photos of certain key things. So you take photos of the doctor's office, see if that provokes any kind of anxiety in your okay. child. Like, do they recognize it? Take a photo of the doctor, take a photo of the waiting room, take a photo of the chair, take a photo of uh, someone sitting in the chair. Ideally, take a photo of the child sitting in the chair, but right. whatever you can. Take a photo of a tourniquet on someone's arm. Everything that is a stimulus that's 
you know, and then go through. And, and so you do all this, you produce these steps. Now you have a series of steps that are pictures and, and visual steps. And then you have a series of steps which are actual in vivo, which means the person doing each step. Right. So you put that aside for a minute. And then step two of, of doing a systematic desensitization is to teach the individual some form of thing, behavior that's contrary to anxiety. So this would be either system, it would be breathing exercises, which we do when your child's five and moderate. So you could do this, which is essentially one. You're just counting and breathing because if you get a lot of oxygen, you're not gonna be hyper anxious. You're right. gonna calm down a little bit. Other techniques that work very, very well with our kids are that are contrary to anxiety are music, like, yeah. um, uh, sound noise reduction headphones that allow you to just have silence and be able to listen to something you like. Yeah. That's very helpful. Um, any kind of visual distraction. This is why when you go to a dentist, for instance, they have TV monitors now, right? right? So any, like let's say your favorite cartoon or whatever, something that's a distraction. These are all your tools for, for helping the individual cope. So you have a series of these things, which are like relaxation, uh, huge reinforcers, distracting reinforcers, food items, whatever, things that will completely allow the person to cope. And then you have this series of stimuli that are anxiety and fear provoking. Yeah. And you pair them starting with the least uh, fear provoking. So for instance, you would, uh, let's say your child recognizes the picture, picture of the office. So you'll show the picture and then um, just have the picture present. And if the child starts to like have anxious reaction, then you will prompt the child to do one of those breathing exercises, let's say, or to take their headphones and put it on and, and they're fine with it. Right. And you keep going up and you will all eventually, uh, well, let's say, assume you're doing pictures only, you will eventually get to a point where it produces a reaction in the child. So for instance, let's say if you have a picture of a person in the chair with a tourniquet on there, and, and the person, you know, the phlebotomist trying to draw blood, that most likely will cause some sort of anxiety or phobia in the right. child. And when that does, you just leave the picture there and you practice the uh, breathing and you tell the child, do you want something to drink? Do you want something to eat? Do you want to listen to music? Whatever it right. is. And you help them find a distraction that's also calming. And when they're completely fine with it, you know, where you, they couldn't care less, you take the picture away, you represent it multiple times, that we, and you make sure they're very fine with it, and then you go to the next level. Okay. And when you've done all the visuals, you want to start doing the actual in vivo, obviously, which means driving to the location. Go as far as you can with the child. Now, the child has, has to have become very good at self um, administering reinforcer and distractor. That's a very important skill you can teach your child. Yeah. Not just for this, for everything. Teaching our children to give themselves, to regulate themselves, to yes. give themselves reinforcers and to give themselves calming exercises, to give themselves headphones when it's overstimulating, to give themselves sunglasses when the lights are too, to give themselves self-regulating, calming things is a huge value anyway. Yeah. So your child assumedly has done that now and now you'll go to a point of like, go as far as you can. Like talk to the doctor obviously and tell them you're doing training and then go to the waiting room, go inside. A, a lot of times these phlebotomists, the chair is empty. So you could just go there, practice, sitting there and don't go further stop at where it is anxiety provoking and j get that stage dealt with right and when that stage is calm and acceptable go to the next stage now right. there's one step prior to the injection that you can actually prior to the blood draw the the puncture that you can practice at home which is use a pen yeah to instead of the needle use it without the tip out right. first and just practice it just press so let the child become familiar with this sensation of actually pressing a, a small object on their skin and the smaller the better yeah. and that will help as well to add that step in that will really really help absolutely i i, I feel like it's strange i'm having a memory of us doing some of this with gem
Okay. Um, I, which I had totally, when we started this question, I didn't remember this, but I remember doing some of that with therapists mm -hmm. and I, and they also had me get, um, uh, one of those play medical kits and have him Practice. do that to us. Yes, so absolutely. There's a little needle and he would come and do it to me and I would have a non-reaction. Totally. And we just had blood drawn the other, I totally had forgotten about this because I was like, oh, this really isn't our thing, but it had been at one point mm -hmm. and we had blood drawn the other day and it was such a non-event. Ish issue for him. Yeah. Yeah, fear is more in our heads than than something, I mean, obviously there are certain kids go through certain procedures that are horrendous, but you know this type of thing is just more about what we the the it's made up fear it's not really a painful event it's not a significantly painful thing a blood draw is one prick yeah you know and so it's not that big but kids are often just not familiar they don't know what's coming oh, yeah like my my uh, you know i didn't vaccinate my kids for the longest time and so one of my kids charlie she was i guess 12 or something when we did her first blood draw and she'd never been in any way punctures, right? And she was like terrified of the whole thing. And then she just sat there and she was like, well, that was nothing. Like, you know, and I yeah. was like, yeah, it's totally in your head. Like yeah. you just get it so scared about it. It's very interesting. Okay, well, great. And and if you want to know more information, if they want to see the presentation that you've done on that, is there a possibility we can hook them up with that? Absolutely. Okay. I can actually try to find that PowerPoint. I have it and send it to you. That particular presentation is not just about injections it's also about uh, pill swallowing okay so it's uh, it does medical procedures so it's okay, like great. blood draw and pill swallowing and in the meantime if you would write and tell us who your supervisor is yes, so that please. we can I'd let Dr. Grampuche know that right. um, thank you so much for writing into right. it I want to go to another question mm -hmm. uh, somebody wrote in and said hi thanks for your time I'm a regular follower of your show I have a two and a half year old who grinds his teeth when he is awake mm. not all the time but sometimes and he stopped it for some time but again started before we used before we used a vibrating toothbrush and crunchy stuff when he grinds his teeth please suggest something that he can uh, to stop, stop it, it completely. completely yeah it's difficult um, you have to okay so the behavioral way to deal with this and then I'll tell you kind of an easier way but the behavioral okay. way to deal with this is to uh, is to time is to count the number of times he uh, does grind his teeth in in an hour or throughout the course of the day if you want to be really accurate. So um, it, let's say you count the number of times he grinds his teeth throughout the course of the day and it ends up being once every 20 minutes, I don't know, whatever, whatever it is. It's your baseline, that's your baseline. And so then what you are doing is you're going to be reinforcing non-occurrence of the behavior. So what you'll do is you will, and sometimes, let's say the first time you measure how often he does it, and it's once every 20 minutes, and then you measure it on another day, and it's once every 15 minutes, or it's more, it's variable. Let's say if it's like completely variable, it'll, it'll do it at 15 minutes, then it'll do it for another hour. Then what you do is you average it out and you basically get an average concept of, okay, so on the average he's doing it every 15 minutes or something. And sometimes when you start intervention, which is the reinforcing of non-occurrence of it, it might be even more frequent. So don't worry if your baseline becomes pretty frequent. But whatever is your baseline, whatever the frequency is that he does it at, you will start to reinforce him like 10 seconds or one minute after that and make sure that he is not, uh, you know, and just really make a huge deal about it, like good job and so on. Now, if it happens during your period of time waiting, then you have to restart it, of course, and okay. then start again. Now, that's the behavioral procedure, and it takes a really long time, and it's uh, because you will have to shape it up and increase it from, let's say, 10 minutes to an hour to a day. You know, it's just a very, very long procedure. It, the easier thing to do is to prevent it from happening, which means go see a dentist and get a mouth guard for him. Okay. Um, they're, it's, they're very similar to, um, well, they make these mouth guards for kids for sleep time, but you could easily put the mouth guard in at times where you feel like he's about to grind. And if he keeps it in, quite honestly, the habit will be broken. The habit of grinding will be broken. It's a habit. 
So, and also the other thing is like, uh, if he has it in, it might be good to help massage his muscles here. These trigeminal muscles are the reason people um, uh, do that with their teeth or move their jaw back and forth is because they're trying to strain these muscles or stretch the muscles. So try to massage these muscles, but a mouth guard will prevent it and it'll break the habit. Okay, great. Yeah. I love that. Um, we had a lot of people who were writing in live. I just want to say somebody, um, Mike, mm -hmm. our wonderful friend Mike, wrote in and said, could we please put uh, this on Netflix because they'd like to be able to watch it on Netflix. That's something we've been looking at for a long, long time. Gosh, that, I don't even remember why we didn't. Because, can I tell you, because yes, I was one please, of the people please. on the committee that uh, Netflix had a rule at the time that if it was a movie and it was a documentary, it had to be over 60 minutes and it's 58 <laughs> minutes. Now, we should look at it again because I know Netflix was talking about expanding that rule, but that was why. But you know what, Mike? I will I will look at that today to see if Netflix has changed. It was just a rule and they were a lot of people were complaining about it, so we'll see if they've changed it. But that's yeah. why it's not on Netflix. Yeah, thank Isn't you. That crazy? We will try to ha and we might also want to look at Hulu as another option. I absolutely. Guess. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank but you. you can watch it on Amazon. Um, Okay, next question. I have a student who is nonverbal and screams quite often. Recently, uh, she mm -hmm. has started to scratch and dig her nails purposely. Uh, the adult's uh, hands, her, the adult's hands, and her mother's hands. Uh, the child will do this through excitement or anger. How do we help her to stop digging her nails? Mm, that's terrible. Um, okay, so we have to figure out why. Okay, so there's two behaviors here. One is screaming and one is scratching and digging her nails into people's hands. We have to figure out what the function is of each one. Uh, let's, you're, the writer is asking only about the scratching and digging, so we'll talk about that. Um, and it may appear that they're doing it when they're excited or angry, but, and, and it could very well be that both functions exist, but you would really need to have someone do an FBA. Um, and a functional assessment is very important to be able to tell the scenarios under which it exactly happens and also how the behavior occurs. So, uh, you know, do, what are the things? List all the times that the child does this and list exactly what happened before it and how it was handled, what happened after it, because it could also be consequence maintained. So. Let's make sure we figure that out. Now, uh, assuming the child might do it when, um, or the student might do it when, let's say, a demand is placed, and they don't really want to do that, and they'll do it, or um, they're angry about something, and they'll press, and so on and so forth. You really need to identify the function. The function always identifies the intervention. So if the function is excitement, we're going to have a completely different intervention than if the function is anger. So, and if it's both, we're going to have to identify the situations where it's, ang where it's ang uh, excitement, deal with them one way, and where it's anger and deal with them a completely different way. So I don't want to give you a lot of feedback on how to deal with it until we know what the function is. And this person said that it's a student of theirs, so mm -hmm. I, I'm hoping that they have a BCBA who works with the school who could right. come in and do that FBA. Right, absolutely, right? you should. I mean, most schools have a resource department and have a, a behavior analyst who can do an FBA. Uh, and otherwise request that because yeah. you need to have that. I mean, and it's important to have that because if, if someone does that from excitement, I mean, I mean, if someone does that from excitement, then in some ways it's okay and they're just uh, seeking out the, the sensory aspect of it or it's the individual, it's the student's way of sharing their excitement. It's almost like, uh, let's say, if two people win something, they might hug each other and go, right. yeah, you know, so it's kind of a, a sharing or expressing to them and that's something that could easily be re redirected to let's say pressing someone's hands in excitement right. whereas if, if someone is doing this behavior from anger that's a completely different behavior and I wouldn't want to allow that to continue and I'd want to teach her a form of requesting that replaces that yeah. and this is a nonverbal child or, or a student and that is incredibly important to have some form of communication for this student because 
without the communication ability we never we don't know what they want we don't know what they're trying to communicate to us so you know more importantly and i always tell people this if you can when you don't have when you have someone who doesn't have communication you're either really lucky in that they're very passive and in some cases medicated and don't have uh, too many needs or they don't express too many needs or they will have a lot of needs and we don't know what they are now you either you know very rare circumstances you'll have a parent around who always predicts the individual's needs and they keep them happy yeah. in real life that doesn't happen we get frustrated when we can't express ourselves so you can either deal with each uh, uh, episode of challenging behavior and you could do that forever or you can teach the individual communication and it will in the long term uh, really decrease all the challenging behaviors because the challenging behaviors are just uh, a way to communicate you know for instance in this case the child the student might be saying wow that's so exciting or get away from me you don't want to do this right. or um, you know like I hate this skill this specific lesson or uh, whatever I'm tired right now whatever it is you know and it's communication so it's very important to realize that teaching communication is really the thing that's necessary yeah. here and the fact that uh, the student is nonverbal doesn't change anything you can absolutely start a PEX program for this individual you can teach them on an augmentative device, you can teach them reading, um, keyboarding, you can teach them a Proloquo on an iPad. There's a multitude of things to do to help people communicate. Okay, great. Okay, hi, I love your show. How do I work, and we love you, how do I work on processing speed and working memory? Can you give me some practical ideas to work on these areas? He has scored low in these areas, and thanks for your thoughts. So those are the two areas that a lot of people have issues with. It, you know, look at another one down here. Yes. It's the same thing, processing yes. speed and working memory. And I have another child right now who's having issues with processing speed and working memory. They're both practice. We have, I mean, here's the short answer. We have uh, activities, lessons for both of these in our uh, cognition curriculum. Um, maybe also in our executive functioning curriculum, but definitely in our cognition curriculum in uh, skills. So go to skillsforautism.com. There you go. I have my little, my little reminder thing because I can never remember the phone number. 877-975-4559 is the phone number. Um, and there's skillsforautism.com. Uh, and it's forautism.com, but the phone number is 877-975-4559. Um, and, and they actually have someone who can help talk you through stuff as well. Uh, amazing woman that we've had on the show before, Robin Hogerheis. So check it out. Those lessons are amazing. Yeah, and don't be afraid. These t tend to be the two big areas for our kids. Okay. Uh, moving on, my 14-year-old daughter is still not potty trained. We've come close, but she is in a diaper every day. I would love, all in capitals, for her to be toilet trained. Where do we begin? She's nonverbal and still has a lot of challenging behavior, self-injurious behavior, uh, aggression, disruption. She is independent, pulling her pants down and sitting on the toilet. She never initiates. She has an iPad with a bathroom icon, but we just hand over hand have her touch it and then we take her. She doesn't use it for other communication except to tell us she wants a snack. She has a one-on-one -on -one at school and thanks for your incredible advice. Thank you so much for writing in. Yes, thank you. And that's a very tough thing and God bless you um, and help you. I hope that you have some help. There's two things to say about this. Um, one is that, and I'm sorry to say this, but we did some research and we published on the fact that as long as, when, it, when an individual wears a diaper, it is less likely they will actually be toilet trained than if they don't wear a diaper. Wearing the diaper almost makes it very comfortable for the individual to void in the diaper and then they never really uh, it's almost like they, their body doesn't get a sign that, 
oh, I need to initiate, oh, I need to go now. So what I would do is probably take a weekend where you've slept well and you're ready to roll and uh, do a full on, I, I generally follow the Fox and Azrin procedure and it's a, a pretty detailed procedure. Everybody knows it, who's a behavior analyst, you probably look it up online. I think we've even provided a, a version of it or a typed up version, which I, if we haven't. We've I done that tons too. of videos about it where it's been detailed. You can go through our library and put in potty training and, and you'll find people talking about it. Right. And uh, I think with this case, what your main thing is just trying to get to the point where, you, you know, you the, the way that it's done, just to quickly say, is that it's not, it doesn't start with initiation. It starts with getting the person on a schedule. So what you what that means is that you would initiate and take her on a regular schedule where you catch every uh, void, whether it's uh, urine or or uh, bowel movement. It doesn't matter. You will you catch it on a schedule. So you figure out how frequently you have to take her so she voids in the toilet every time. Uh, that you can write this down after tracking it for a while, which you know. When we first started, we take the individual every 15 minutes, or actually they sort of live on the toilet for that first day. But you, let's assume she's 14, let's assume she's going to, she's able to urinate, let's say every hour, and that usually most of our kids have a particular time of day where they have a bowel movement, or two times a day where they have a bowel movement, those are the times you want to target for the bowel movement. But what you would be doing is taking her very regularly so she, gets into the habit of <clears throat> voiding on the toilet, then you teach signs and gradually fade yourself away so they initiate. The initiation becomes com it comes sort of after they've been able to be habit trained for a week, uh, um, even a month, in yeah. some cases for a very long time before they learn to initiate. And I, I'm, I'm fairly certain, I know we did a whole segment with Sienna Greener Wooten, Dr. Greener Wooten, um, on the Fox Nazrin, so potty yes. training. So yes. definitely check our YouTube page to get a more Perfect. Uh, lengthy Perfect. Uh, explanation of that. Uh, moving on to, but let us know how it goes because we can revisit this if we need to. Um, the next question, it's like it came to me from my past. I swear I've had this happen many times. Mm -hmm. Good morning. My son is seven with high functioning autism. He is mainstreamed in the first grade and doing pretty well. His teacher reports that he takes a long time in the bathroom. Oh, my <laughs> sister. We, I have been down this path. He's playing in the sink, playing with the hand dryers. He's pretty slow with a lot of things, but I think he's avoiding work, they say. He has a one-to-one -one on uh, one aid for part of the day. What can she do to shorten this time? And thanks, sending you a hug. Been there. That's a really good one. It's an easy one and it's kind of cute. Boys are so easily distractible, my goodness. So, uh, you know, the easiest thing, I guess, is that when he request to go to the bathroom the teacher puts a timer on and hands it to him and that's it he goes and he has to figure out how to get his stuff done and back before the timer goes off and i mean realistically the timer should give him ample time initially and then she can reduce it to eventually get to a point where all other kids use and the, and the only thing, because we did this exactly, and um, uh, the only thing that we did was that when the aide told us, she sent home a note saying that he did it within the time, he got a huge reinforcement. Oh, absolutely. Huge you reinforcement. Always want, and, and every time. So, like, if you start with 10 minutes, you know, and he masters that, reinforce that, and then 9 or 8, 5, 4, whatever, make sure he's reinforced for the reductions in yes. time. And there then, of go. course, the ultimates. And then... After a while, you get rid of the timer. And don't get rid of it all at, all at once. So you get rid of it and then you give it back and then you, so it, make it unpredictable so he doesn't know when the timer is going to be in place. Wonderful, wonderful, and it works, it does work. Um, and we had to do that a couple of different times. Like every year at the start of the year, he would like test the teacher to see, how long can I be in the bathroom before you notice I've been gone a long time? And then we have to institute it again uh, for a day or two and then we were fine. Okay, is it typical for my two and a half year old son who's on the autism spectrum to have sleep issues? He never wakes up happy, mm -hmm. always upset, and periodically wakes up in the middle of the night and needs to be rocked to sleep. Oh, I don't know if I would say it's typical, but it's common. I mean, it's there, so, and it's a big issue, and I would really want anyone who's struggling with this to deal with it. Sleep is such a big, big factor in how we do during the day. 
so yes, I mean, I, you have to, let me just say a couple of things. One is rocking him to sleep, which is of course as a parent, that's what we do. What do you do when your child wakes up? You do, you soothe them, calm them and so on. But it is reinforcement, so it kind of produces a pattern of, that was a really fun experience being rocked to sleep. I might want to do that again tonight. And even it's not even a conscious decision, it becomes a very, it's a physiological pattern that develops, um, especially if there's any kind of water or food or milk associated with that. Uh, when there's any kind of uh, food or drink associated with waking up, we wake up. Our body will crave that and will wake you up like an alarm clock. It's pretty amazing. So uh, make sure that you're doing less of the rocking and less of the giving of any kind of edible or drink or anything during when he wakes up because you don't want to reinforce his waking up. And then I would really, I mean, we have sleep procedures we have, for those kids who are very, very hard to, to fall back asleep. but. And it's more tough on the parents than it is on, a, on, on the child, but it really does have to do with kind of exiting from the letting him teach himself how to fall back asleep. Uh, but in the meantime, maybe you want to talk to his physician about some sort of sleep aid. I personally like to use, and we were, you know, we produced one ourselves, but we just haven't gotten around to doing the marketing of it. But I, there's a melatonin out there called Tranquil Sleep that I really re like. Um, and it has, it's not just pure melatonin, it has uh, tryptophan in it, and that, that makes a huge difference, huge difference. It literally, you know, regular uh, melatonin is great, and melatonin, by the way, is very good, and tryptophan is too for your body, but melatonin on its own has the tendency to wake you up after a few hours, like four hours or six hours. and. Um, this doesn't, so this actually puts you in a very nice deep sleep and within 30 minutes and you sleep through the night. So that's very, very helpful. Uh, there's a lot more I could tell you to help you with sleep. I think, do we have any shows that are just about sleep? We haven't done a show, oh, oh, but we should. We've done lots of segments about sleep, but uh, not a complete show, but we should do that at some yeah, point sleep because is we a get a issue. lot of questions about sleep. Absolutely. Okay, let's do that. I'm going to put that down on this, the schedule, as they say. I'm going to move on to this last question, though, because we only have a mm -hmm. couple of minutes. Uh, Shannon, saw that CARD has the Peers program oh, yes. now, which is a big thrill. Um, uh, and they go on to say, does that program go to high school to work with teens? How is the data taken by the teen or by the therapist? And thank you for bringing the sunshine to the autism world. I was fearful of the A world, A word before finding you, and it's given us so much hope. Thank you for watching us and being with us. So the peers program, maybe if you could give them a little bit of information about what it is and why you brought it to CARD. Because mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I highly respect Dr. Elizabeth Logerson, who's a researcher at UCLA, and it is her program. It's a social skills program, but it, and it teaches parents while it also teaches teens. And it sort of like gives the teens certain exercises and then it gives the parents certain exercises and then it brings them together. And um, it has been shown to be very effective. I think one round of it is somewhere like 12 weeks or something. We just had, uh, Dr. Logason was very kind and she trained I think one or two people from each of our offices. So there was a lot of people in training over three intense days. So uh, we do have a lot of peer, peers experts now at CARD whose job is to uh, start this program up. Uh, what I would suggest, which might actually be kind of a cool thing, is you could get um, Esther Hong, who's the lead here, yes, and she could do a show with you if she hasn't Absolutely. already, yes. and talk a little bit more about peers for all of our families. We'll do that. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea. We do have also uh, some of our psychologists here. Um, I don't know if you've ever had um, Connor Daniel on the show, but they're fabulous to we chat with. We've not had them on the show. We should. They're usually busy, but we, yeah, they're, we'll they're, do that. Yeah, they're amazing. You should have both of them on okay. at the same time. They're so much fun. Okay. And they, they are also trained, and the, the healthcare clinic, their uh -huh. clinic, is also providing peers now to everyone, patients in and out fabulous. of CARD. Fabulous. 